as we previewed before, we want to talk about the interquartile range and outliers. So technically, interquartile range is how we find outliers. All right, so the IQR, interquartile range, is the range, i.e. the higher minus the lower of the quartiles. So the formula for it's right here. You take Q3 and you subtract Q1. But how does that relate to the box plot? So if I go back here to the box plot picture really quickly, you'll notice that this distance from here to here is Q3 minus Q1. That's the IQR, right, from this piece to this piece, which is Q3 minus Q1, okay? All right, so it's the width of the box in your box plot. So when you have your box plot, it's the width from Q1 to Q3. Now the beautiful thing about IQR is that it's resistant to outliers, which will be very nice for us. All right, since it's resistant, that means we can use it for skewed data. Mm -hmm. Because we already learned that standard deviation is not so good for skewed data. Right? Standard deviation and variance are not good with skewed data, but IQR it is. All right, so let's look at a data set right here. We have a data set, which is a sample of Math 133 exam three scores from winter 2014. So just a few of them, well, 29 of them for their size. And we already saw these data before. So it's the same data set we were just working with. And so we want to find the following. We want to find the range, the IQR, the mean, the median, standard deviation, and the variance. Now we already ran these on our calculator, so we actually have a lot of the answers right here. So for example, I can see the mean is 80.897, right there. And then the median, if I use my down arrow, is 84. Let's see, the standard deviation, this was a sample. It says it's a sample, so we would use S here because it's a sample. Actually, I put the S right there. And so that would be 10.598, roughly. And the variance would be S squared. So that'd be 10.598 squared, which of course we could find, or if we used StatCrunch, StatCrunch found it for us. That's the beautiful thing about stat crunch. <laughs> so remember, it's not unadjusted variance. Unadjusted variance is sigma. So the unadjusted standard deviation right here and the unadjusted variance is sigma and sigma squared. We want regular variance, right? 10.598 right there squared makes 112.31. So the variance is 112.31 roughly. And again, you could find that with a calculator if you took 10.598. Five nine eight, and square it. Right? There's a slight rounding error there, right? But that's what you have. All right. Now the range in the IQR. The range is the max minus the min. So range. Let's write that down. Is max minus min. Just as a little review. We've already done this. So that'd be ninety three. Take away fifty four, which is thirty nine. Oh, and for the record, the unit for all of these ones is points because these are points on an exam. You could also maybe argue for percent. I'll use points, right? So this is points right here. Points, points, points. This is points. Yeah, let me erase that box right there. So points. This one is points squared. Useless, but nevertheless, <laughs> there you have it. So I'm just going to assume unit is points, right? All right. So then the IQR is Q3 minus Q1. This is the only new thing. Everything else is review. We've already learned how to find all these other ones. All right. So that would be 88.5 take away 76 if we use the calculator values, which would be... Let's see, 88.5 minus 76, so 12.5. Now, if you use the 
stack crunch values, you would get 12 because it would be 88 minus 76. So you're going to have to allow for the fact that it might be slightly different depending on which way you're going. So just be aware of that and um, double check with your instructor which way they want you to do this or if they can just accept both, which they probably can. All right, let's describe the distribution. All right, so describing this distribution requires three things. We want to know the shape, the center, and the spread. All right, so we don't just want the shape, right? Although we can get that. We want the shape, we want the center, and we want the spread. Okay, so let's look at the mean and the median. The mean is significantly less than the median. So we can say that this is skewed left because the mean is less than the median. This was 80.897, and this was 84. All right, now, back in section 3.1, we learned that when your data set's skewed, you're better off with your median, right? So the median, which is 84 points, you would use because it's skewed. Use because data are skewed. And we know that when it's skewed, the median is resistant. Resists that pull of that skew. Ah, but we also learned up here that the IQR is resistant. And the IQR is a measure of spread. That's what this is saying. It's a measure of variability, a.k.a. spread, right? All right. So if the IQR is a measure of spread and it's resistant then that's what we should be using for our measure of spread. And that's indeed what we will use. So IQR, which is 12.5, oh, it's points also. I didn't see that I didn't give it a unit. Everything basically has the same unit as your data set, except for variance. So it's points, 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 and points squared. <laughs> right? So it'd be 12.5 points, and you use it again because your data are skewed. We'll make another big table about this later, but just a little note. And IQR is resistant. All right, so then one last thing, outliers. We've kind of mentioned them before and talked about them, but we were kind of waving our hands a little bit at them. So how do we truly determine whether something's officially an outlier? And it's a four-step process. So to determine outliers, this is the way, right? Not to sound like the Mandalorian, but there you have it. All right, so outliers, this is how you're going to do it. Step one, you're going to find your Q1 and Q3. Um, but we already did, right? So if I say step one, actually, I'm just going to leave it right here. Um, actually, I'll, do, I'll put it up here. Remember, Q1 was 76. Q3, we just... We already have this from before, was 88.5, or again, 88, depending on which computer program you were working with, right? So we did step one. We already did it a page ago. Step two, we already did that, right? It's right here. It's 12.5. Done. Now, step three, we want our fences. So your fences are going to be your boundaries for normal, right? Your boundaries for the regular zone. And anything outside of that zone is an outlier. Anything outside of the fences, right, is, is an outlier. So let's find the lower fence, which is Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. That's times. That's what the parentheses stands for. So Q1 was 76 minus 1.5. IQR was 12.5. The upper fence is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. Now notice there's a little change in there with that plus, which is 88.5 plus 1.5 times 12.5. So I'm going to need a calculator to find both of these values, but I want to make sure I highlight these fence formulas because these are things I would need on an exam, say, because I'm not going to memorize them. 
All right, so let me grab the calculator. All right, so 76 minus 1.5 parentheses 12.5. Type it like it looks. So order of operations says that actually the multiplication takes place first. So a lot of students do this wrong because they don't realize that you need to multiply 1.5 times 12.5 and then take 76 minus that value, right? So order of operations. Now on a special calculator, you can just type it like it looks and it'll find it for you. So this is 57.25. Just to show you, on Desmos, if you're working um, from a free application, it'd be the same. You know, 76 minus 1.5, 12.5 in parentheses. It knows that it needs to multiply that. So it wouldn't make it any difference if you put a time symbol in there. It still knows it's 57.25. Okay? Now do it again, but 88.5 plus 1.5 times 12.5. Now, keep in mind, if you used the stat crunch output, it would have been 88 and 12. So it would be a slightly different number. So your professor would just have to be prepared for that or would be um, having, they would have to tell you what they want. So for our purposes, because of the numbers we're using, it'd be 107.25. Okay, now step four. You look at your data set, anything that's below 57 or above 107 would be unusual, right? Would be an outlier, sorry. Unusual is beyond two standard deviations. So this is an outlier. This is a more official definition. All right, so we go back up to our data and we see that we have two outliers right there. 54 and 56 are both below that lower fence. So we have two outliers at 54, whoop, 54 <laughs> and 56 are below the lower fence. Now the thing about outliers is they should be rare. If you do all of this work and you come up with 18 outliers, you've done something wrong. So these are the below ones. There's no above, um, no outliers above the upper fence. Okay. So let me just make one more note. Outliers should be a rare value that's far away from the rest of the data. Now, how do we determine far away? They're past the fences, right? So far away is outside these fences. You shouldn't have a ton of them in a data set. There should be, you know, a few, a couple, <laughs> right? But it shouldn't be tons and tons. So that are far away from the rest of the data. Far away is defined as outside of the fences. But again, there should not be, you know, 25 values that are there. I mean, it depends on how big your data set is, but in, in a standard small data set, it shouldn't be lots. It should be maybe, you know, a couple, maybe three, something like that.